you decided to open your place. You're calling for mama now? It's a little late, don't you think? Girl, I'll go out there and fetch me some of that, uh, uh, you know that, uh, that green wide leaf. And I need some of that yellow root. Bring me some of that. And girl, go over there and milk, milk me a little bit of that goat milk. Cause I'm gonna have to put some molasses with that. That molasses, you know, is good for her. So when the milk comes, and I need you to go and get me some of that bacon yeast. You know that, that yeast that rises, you know that whole, one of them rolls and stuff. I need that right now. Bring that to me. Let me gather this other stuff up for this girl. We got to rub her down. Got to have some of that holy oil to put on her. You know, we don't want her skin to stretch out. We don't want it to break. It's really important. Come on, girl, so I can put this stuff together. Here, here, put it on. Put it on down here for me. Come on. Here. I need you to round that part up, you know, with that yellow root, with that, with that big leaf fluffy. And I'll mix this up. Girl, hurry up with that milk. I'm telling you, I need it right now. That's what I'm talking about. Pour it on in there, baby. That's right. You gonna be all right, girl. I'm calling for your mama. Mm -hmm. We mix these things together. You know, we mix this, this molasses and, and a little bit of uh, a honey in there and, and then we put a, you know, just a hint, a little bit of oats, just a, a half a handful of sprig in there. Come on, we're going to make a little bit uh, of food for her because she ain't been eating nothing. She knows she's going to need some milk, y'all. Yeah. Here, did you get that other stuff ground for me? Let's put that in. Oh, man. Here you go, girl. Here, just a little bit now, a little bit at a time. Did you get that salve together for me? I've been telling y'all, I've been talking to y'all about that salve, how we gotta put that together. Here, here, let me just take over. That's right. Oh, you gotta ground it in. Here, pull, pull, pull the yellow root in. Pull the yellow. You got some of that holy oil, you know that kind we put on you. You know what kind I need. Uh-huh. Pour some of that oil up in here. All right, just a little bit so that we can just smooth it over. I need some pork fat. Bring some pork fat now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come on. We won't have to put it on that girl because, honey, her stomach didn't got big. Now, she didn't come when she was supposed to. Now, she won't come now. Yeah, let me just rub some on that girl. You'll be all right. Quick, call on for your mama, girl. You're going to be all right. Here, let me, let me size you a little bit. I'm just going to size you just a little bit, girl. That's all right, girl. It's going to be all right, man. It's all right. Mama got you. Uh-huh. Old Granny, you know she take care of everything. Yeah. That's right. Here, give me some of that mowing. And, and yeah, you talk to her. Rub her hands and stuff. Tell her how much you love her, girl. Because the man ain't nowhere around. He even touched her and walked away. Mm, we used to that kind of stuff. Maybe you're going to be all right, I promise you. Here, there you go, girl. Here, calm down, baby. Calm down. This will keep you from stretching all out and have them, like, you know, them kind of, they call them the railroad tracks on you. Don't want them railroad tracks on you, baby. Here, turn over to the side. I put a little bit on your back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you gonna see, I told you it's gonna be calm. You ain't got to call for your mama, baby. We got you over here. We got you. Yeah, y'all talk to her for a minute while I talk to everybody else. You know, there were things that we used being wet nurse. You know, I've been a wet nurse for a oh, good 25, almost 30 years. Then they start calling me the mammy that come and help the babies come. That was 
my job. Man, this was before we even got freed. I was doing this. I was doing this before we got free. You know, they wanted to sell because I had no more breast milk, you know. But I knows what to do. Don't nobody knows. I knows what to do. I told him, I said, bring me some peaches off that tree. And you got some of them cots over there. You know them little, you know them orange ape cots they call it. And then I told him, bring me some, bring me some, uh, some root bar, keep a bowels open. You know, we put all them greens together, and then we put all the fruits together, and, and we mix that up. Uh, they said, in this, uh, uh, this spinach, uh, and we got some garlic greens, and we cut them all up real fine till they was juicy, just with a little bit of water. We ain't cooked them. We just kept cutting it until it was teeny tiny, and we ground it after that. So it was kind of like a, a juice, kind of. And we mixed all the different greens we had, and we put them all together. They were strong with iron, vitamin C's, they say, and uh, 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 some other vitamin they say is for your skin. But it helps with the Oh, uh, what they call that, sir? Fibers. Mix that fibers inside. It goes through the this long, well, I don't know what y'all call it, but uh, we call it a long pipe. And if it goes from the long pipe on the inside, it makes everything come out real good. No hard pressing, because we got to get her ready so when she get ready to have this baby, she can't be not being able to move that, uh, that back part, you know what I'm talking about. Y'all mm -hmm. know about that? Mm -hmm. All right. So we gave her what we had was the, the ghost milk, and we add some molasses to it, a little bit of honey, and the yeast that we mix to make the bread rise, we mix with that. Now in this day and age, they kind of call it, uh, they said it's something about the bees. Bees, uh, bees, uh, some kind of vitamins they call them. Now they do. Back at that time, we just put it together because we know when the milk comes, it's going to be a lot of milk. We needed that milk. Because a man going to drink it, her baby going to get a little bit, and uh, Miss Ann's baby, because you know she can't a baby at the same time. So when her baby comes, we know who's that Miss Ann ain't going to be uh, putting nothing on the nitty. She don't want nothing on her nitty. She wants us to put the camphor on her and wrap us tight on the top. And then wrap us real tight on the bottom so she can pull in and pull in them corset things on. You know, the kind that they, they had them corset things. But we used long pieces of white cotton off the messy, we put that camphor on the oil, and we put it up on her, her ninnies, because it was real full, that helped dries that milk, because she don't want nobody sucking on her, they keep sending them to me like I'm the only one who got some milk around here, but now you won't be the one that takes over, because I ain't got no more milks no more. Mix that you got for your own baby. It's gonna be the mix for Miss Ann, baby, too. Miss Ann ain't gonna sell you. She not to sell me at any moment in time. But I'm gonna be here for you now. So I don't want you crying no more. I'm gonna stay here as long as they have, man. But that milk from that goat, all those good ingredients they've got inside going to make so much milk till you're going to be able to feed twinses on your knees. One baby yours and the other baby misses. Now, after all that's done, baby, you will have milk for a long, long time. 
He's going to have to impregnate somebody else. You know the master. He's going to have to come impregnate somebody else. Because you ain't going to get pregnant no more for a while. As long as you got them sucking on your nipples. Mm. Now when my great, great, great grandma, when she was a slave before Reconstruction, they had a bounty out on her head. Her name was Maria Darcy. Now, Miss Maria, they thought that she was a mulatto slave. She wasn't. She was we in Miami. Y'all don't know nothing about we in Miami. Because most of them is extinct except for the ones that's inside us. We ain't got no more pure bread meals. They ain't got no more Miami Indians. We call Washita. The Washita. That's me. They think of all oh, everybody saying, oh, you know she African. That's all right. I be African for them just to stay alive and not be raped over and over and over again. I done already had some days in my life. When I was too young to even know what they was doing to me, they was already doing me. My first baby came at age 12. But my great, great, great grandma, she ran before she started having babies by the master. She ran. She ran so far till she found herself up in Washington State and on her way. She was on her way to Canada. You know, I ain't never been to Canada, but I heard about it from my grandma when she told me the story. She said that when Maria ran away, her great grandmother, when she ran away, that she was running. And she ran to the safe house where they had the big quilts flowing all the different dark colors. Wasn't no red on them quilts because you know if you saw red on the quilt, that meant you couldn't go there. It wasn't safe. So what they did was she went to the one safe house where they called these people the Quakers. Got to the Quaker's house, and when she got to that Quaker house, they said, "Come on in. We got some food for you. Now we got to make a pan up, and we gonna give you some uh, a lot, some food in there with a maybe a whole piece of chickens, so you could go on about your way before." The sun comes up. We gonna put you underneath this wagons. You ride up underneath there. And as you ride, we go get to go to the stops. They won't be seeing you because there be too many animals on top. They won't even know you're there. That's how she escaped into freedom. That's how my great great grandmother was born when she met. When she met my great great grandpa, Papa Watts. You know, the Darcy's and the Watts come together. Then the Darcy's and the Watts became Johnson's. But they were still enslaved, though some of them because they kept taking the freedmen back. And the women that got pregnant, they sold them. Then they sold the babies once they got to a certain stage, little, tiny little ones that could be bed warmers. You know, they put them inside the bed with them, lay down with our babies. They had already laid down with us. They had laid down with our men. Lay down with my floods and my gossips. They didn't care who they laid down with as long as they was born. They start to mix. 
Then my great great grandfather, he had to kill a white man because he was coming to rape his wife one more time. And he couldn't handle it. So he killed him and he moved from that part, coming to Virginia. And he at this point, he's in North Carolina. Then in 1874, he came to a point where he had to kill the man that was going to rape his wife again and he had daughters. So he had to leave there and he went to Kentucky. There was a big old poster saying, anybody want to go to the promised land? They was like, what the promised land is? We all want to go to the promised land. And in the promised land, they said there was gold and water, all the water you needed. The promised land was Nicodemus, Kansas. The only way to get there was $15 on the black car. Regardless of what the weather was, we was all happy to get our $15 together. We put our monies together. Mm -hmm. We got grandma. We got great grandma. We got, oh, oh. The auntie already here, she a baby, she's coming. My, my grandma was already, my great grandma was already pregnant with my Aunt Mary Magdalene. And then they came together because they changed the name from Jackson to Jones because it was a freed name. That's how important it was to find freedom. People literally split. Some folks went this direction and kept their name as Jackson's, and the others changed their name to Jones so they could move further north. They ended up in the Midwest on this black car in a little town called Nicodemus on the Solomon River, and the car that said was in the Grams Counties. Between 1874 and 1877, they came. When they came, they started having babies, lots of babies. And then it was my, my grandma's turn, 1900. She was born. Bernice Marie Slaughter Cannon. Wow, people was proud of her. She was beautiful. By the time she was 13, she was already promised. And her sister Mary Magdalene was promised to the brother. So Earl Andrew Jones and Skylar Jones, two brothers, married two sisters, Mary Magdalene and Bernice Marie. They started having children. By the time my mom got here, she was number 15, but only number 13 of the living. My grandmother had two sets of twins. Her sister had three sets of twins and a set of triplets. She had 10 children. Right now, one of them just turned 103 on September the 19th. 2018. On Saturday, my grandmother's firstborn daughter turned 100 on this Saturday that just passed. But when they got pregnant, there were things that they did. Like the camp I talked to you about earlier. They rubbed the camphor, they took baths in olive oil, they put <coughs> pig lard on their skin to keep their skin from breaking. They wrap their bodies in long sheets to support their stomachs so they will have what we call memory. The memory to hold yourself in so you didn't have to think about it. There were certain foods that they ate that were specific to making milk, to keeping a woman's mind balanced. 
different herb teas that they use that you won't hear about from my sister when she come up there hear about it. But I just want to start your day with the vision that we didn't lay on our backs and have no babies. We squatted down and we had the licorice root stick in our mouths to hold us, to keep us from screaming while we held onto the tree and bared down. Wasn't no laying on your back like you was a turtle and folks was up here trying all up on you and thing. Your mama was there, maybe your older sister or older cousin. All oh, blood, what no strange folks touching, show what no man coming putting their hands on no private parts of your body. It was a woman to give birth and to be taught later would stay inside for at least a month or so with the baby. Cause your pores wide open. You catch anything up in you. You know what I'm talking about? We had to think about that. Because if you catch something, then that means the milk got something too. It was all about keeping people safe. Keeping people safe. Feeding and nurturing the baby. Michelle's turn now, y'all. <laughs> Come on, Miss Michelle. Miss Slavery, and, and they got their 40 acres in the pen of mule. And they had Africans and uh, Native Americans, Buffalo soldiers, and a motley crew of folks who went there to have their freedom and to start their own town. She's a direct descendant of, of that lineage and was born and raised there until uh, just about a teenager. And so those. Those strong ties and connections uh, with uh, the, the history and, and how we as African Americans, Native Americans, or however we're defined as, survived the period of colonization in slavery. Um, she's not, uh, she's very much like a lot of the people that I interviewed during the six years that um, I documented the tradition of black folk medicine, African-American healing tradition. Um, and um, it was a really profound experience. It's an oral tradition, a lot of information, uh, a lot of uh, strong, resilient people, a lot of uh, terror and, and, and hurt. And we can't talk about that tradition, and particularly postpartum care, without looking at the reality of slavery and colonization and uh, the black woman being commodified, <coughs> um, which all of the people were commodified, and um, sold 
for their ability to uh, birth children and also to produce milk as wet nurses. That was, you know, one of the primary um, jobs of some of the women. And um, so it's, it wasn't this kind of idyllic situation where we have bring this beautiful child into the world and a lot of times you knew that this child may just be snatched and sold. You had no say. And you may be taken at any time to produce more children. And then you may be made to continue to feed the children that weren't even your own. Um, can you imagine the psychological torment of not being able to care for yourself after that, but always caring for someone else? And that memory This whole journey has just been very emotional for me. Even from when I began in the 90s. The DNA carrying the memory and the trauma and the scars that are still there that we see today. And you know, so we're still we're still caring for ourselves. Where, where is the postpartum care that needs to be, you know, the mental care, the body care? But the people survive because we're here in many different, different forms. Um, cross bloodlines. All of my family is from Mississippi and Louisiana. I'm a first generation northerner. Um, so we survived and they, they, they did. They did the best that they could. They did brilliantly. Um, well, and then they retained a lot of the traditions from Africa, also, um, that they could. For example, um, the uh, before birth, or in some communities it's called, um, well, the after birth. In some communities it's called before birth as opposed to afterbirth. Um, and then the afterbirth is, is, is can, when, when you're, you're cremated and the remains of you here after you've been here. So the before, before birth was jarred and preserved um, and um, labeled uh, and at times used for different uh, hoodoo remedies down the line. It was used for nutrients um, to make soups from, uh, frozen, taking it, freezing it in the freezer or keeping it in a safe spot and taking um, a tablespoon or two and putting it in a cup of water and drinking that to help heal the body, to have the, have the memory in your body and also to get nutrients back in your body. Yeah, this, is, this has been a very difficult uh, journey looking at, at this part of a traditional African-American community. Um, a lot of the women that I spoke to, uh, just they, they had one foot, foot in slavery and Jim Crow and one foot out of it. And they were very strong and resilient and worked um, from sun up to sun down. And um, had a lot of babies. And, like Miss Dot, she uh, she had 11 or 12 children. She would get up about 4 o'clock, pick 100 pounds of cotton, and then she would go um, to the factory and work there. And then after the factory, she'd go to Miss Ann's house and work there while her mother was taking care of her children. So this was just the reality of, of survival. There was, there was never any self-care, and I've been reflecting on, you know, sometimes uh, black women are, are called uh, uh, angry black woman, crazy black woman, well, all of that, holding all of that, nurturing 
the wealth of this country, creating the wealth, and just thinking about a lot of the, the leaders or so-called leaders or those who are in positions of power who were nurtured on a black titty or their fathers and their fathers and to have such you know, hatred and disdain is just mind-boggling to me. They're, they're, the healing has to happen um, to them because they're crazy. I'm sure it's tearing them up inside and, and to us. But we're standing here strong today and we're continuing to move our communities forward and to care for our communities. Um, so that, that was one, one way of, of, uh, of taking care of self and also taking care of the baby was to take the, the, uh, the forebirth, that's what I call it, put it in a jar, and create soup from it and digest it or even use it for hoodoo on down the line. Um, another way, Sister Yemanya said, is, is it, was, it was about putting the nutrients back into your system. And um, uh, Ms. Patterson said, when it, I think she had 11 or 12 children, and she would get about two or three days of rest after she had her child. She would be working right up until she had her child. She had been working on a farm ever since she was, uh, could walk just about. And then her husband would bring her just a big pot of salad. They called collard greens, mixture with turnip greens, mustard greens, any kind of green salad. And to get those nutrients back in her system along with the yam which are very nutritious. And she would just be able to lie down and rest. And then she would get back up and go out and work. Because if you didn't work, you didn't eat. And usually the, uh, the, the, old, the elders, yeast was very important also. Because it does help to um, increase lactation. Um, and So different recipes were made with uh, some of these uh, food ingredients, boiled yams or sweet potatoes or blended up with uh, goats, fresh goat's milk and molasses or fresh cow's milk, little cinnamon and nutmeg and made into a custard or either it was just it drank, drunk, should they drink it right there and that has a high nutritional content and also a lot of fiber. They would also uh, make uh, douches using uh, alum and also salt, regular salt, salt, not Epsom salt, but the alum helps to bring the uterus uh, back to shape and also helps to clean it out and prevent any infections from there. So they would warm up some water, uh, put it in one of the red uh, old school bags and then use that as a douche. For the body all along during pregnancy and afterwards, uh, salves would be made to put on to keep it supple so you don't, don't have the uh, uh, stretching. And um, that was also mixed with herbs to help with the circulation. So the camphor and other types of mint. Um, also using the comfrey, which helps to stitch you know, different parts of, of your body back together internally. Olive oil was used a lot, and, and olive oil, salt, and milk baths were um, um, made to soak in. It also pulls a lot of the toxins from your body and also helps your body to relax and also to stay supple. The milk, don't think of the milk or the goat's milk as being the milk of today because there was a lot of fat content in it. And it did, certainly didn't have the toxins that it did back then. If, if, if women were at a point where they um, couldn't nurse anymore and needed to go back to work, they'd make a camphor salve 
with um, using olive oil usually or some tallow which is pork fat and uh, beef fat and rub it on their chest and that helps to dry it up and also wrap it up with the cloth. If a woman was uh, herniated after pregnancy, which happened uh, often as well as the baby, uh, they would take a silver dollar and put it over the, the navel, this is for the female and the baby, and wrap it up and move it on there for two to three weeks and it would go down. Uh, and I actually did that with my very own daughter uh, when my grandmother was alive. And she died at 104. She, uh, we did that and kept it wrapped around and her navel is in and beautiful. She also uh, warned me not to put my hands over my head um, while I was pregnant because uh, it would, the umbilical cord would wrap around the child's neck and would strangle. And I, at that time, I said, oh, no, it's, um, I, I don't necessarily believe you, and uh, it's okay, I'm hanging my clothes out in the backyard. She called her friend, Miss Ethel, from uh, Donaldsonville, Louisiana, who was 98 at the time. And uh, then she called me back about an hour later. She said, I talked to Miss Ethel, and she agreed with me. <laughs> and she said, you shouldn't raise your hands above your head. And so I didn't for the rest of the, that, my pregnancy, and, and my daughter came out fine. That was the key. I have to interrupt on yes. that. Yes. Because it didn't seem like there was enough said. Okay. That, the reason why they didn't want you to raise your hands over your head is because the umbilical cord would be around the baby's neck. Yes. And uh, it was just something that happened to, to be overworked, lifting too much, mm -hmm. hernia, and that. Those were very, very prevalent. Real things. Mm -hmm. Okay, it wasn't just an old wives' tale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, she was very adamant about that. Okay. Um, so I actually, uh, some other, I'll just go through this list of, of, um, of postpartum care that was done um, traditionally as a traditional African American um, uh, care during colonization and slavery. Um, lots of massaging and washing of the baby and the mother afterwards uh, to get the circulation back moving um, and also for the skin and to prevent uh, back pains and varicose veins, uh, open the pores and make sure that everything's working well for both the mother and the baby using olive oil uh, Vicks, wintergreen, or peppermint. Um, the afterbirth was also used, uh, and this is folks in Louisiana and Mississippi would say the afterbirth also and use it to rub on their skin because they felt it would help them to preserve their youth. <coughs> In order to uh, help, and Sister Yemanya talked about that, this, in order to help the body to get its form and shape back, uh, they would take big, long cloths, about five yards long, and wrap it around the waist very tight and hold it there, as well as before that, putting a salve around the um, stomach uh, so that it can it can conform back to its, uh, to its shape and stay supple and, and not uh, get the, uh, um, um, what I, I have on my stomach for my two babies, the stretch marks. And also what they would do quite frequently during the first three days is have a big pot of boiling water on the stove so that it could create a natural humidifier and oftentimes put um, some type of mint leaves in there to help cleanse the air. It could have been sage, it could have been mint, it could have been bay leaf. And so they keep that going for about three days uh, for mother and for baby. Um, and also if there's a lot of congestion that's there. Mm -hmm. Then there are also a number of um, 
things that people did to prevent pregnancy because they didn't want to get pregnant in order to uh, and bring a child into uh, those that situation. Mm -hmm. um, which herbs, uh, cottonseed um, herb, uh, the seed was used in it. Um, uh, uh, could stimulate abortion. If you had castor oil also, that can stimulate abortion. Um, and this is about postpartum care. This isn't about abortion, but but it was a, you know you didn't always want to bring a, a human being into that kind of condition. Um, today, of course, there are we have access to a lot of information about what women are are doing to take care of themselves after after birth, um, and. Uh, from many different tra traditions around the globe. Um, I'm sure that you all probably know more than I do with regards to that. Most of my book uh, relies on what was done, what women did during that time of Jim Crow and what they, they remember during slavery to uh, bring themselves and the children forward. Um, so, And most of my work is based on first-hand accounts and oral tradition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, I haven't really delved into looking at the research that's probably online and all of the latest um, um, things that women are doing to take care of them, themselves. Uh, but I would like to know if any of the things that I've told you and shared with you do they resonate or is it similar to some of the traditions in uh, other cultures that, you, that you're studying? Okay. Do some, some of them also come from Africa or the Caribbean or similar there? The wrapping seems like it happens in a lot of cultures. Okay. And women also talked about eating the chalk or the clay, which is directly an African tradition. This is before when they're pregnant and after being pregnant, but being very careful to make sure that if they get it, it does come from um, a, a source that is safe. Because you can't just really recommend today going out and finding a mound of dirt um, or clay, actually, to eat, which is rich with with many nutrients in it. I think of um, my grand, my grandmother's sister when she was pregnant in mm -hmm. Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and my grandmother and her sisters and her family would make fun of her because she created dirt, mm -hmm. and so she would go outside and like dig in the red, the red dirt and eat it. Mm -hmm. And I think about that of like they were like, ha ha ha, she's so mm -hmm. ridiculous. But through reading even that little part, I was like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That that was definitely a need and a want, and also like had a historical lineage mm -hmm. that my family had as lost, mm -hmm. but in that moment that she was able to get back to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because clay patties are made and sold in, in many countries uh, throughout the diaspora and in Africa, and also in Louisiana and Mississippi and Georgia. They would make the clay patties and eat them. Um, and it's extremely nutritious. Um, in my book, Working the Roots, I have a section on um, women's health and also a section on babies. And um, I don't know how many of you, have any of you been able to look through this yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, maybe I'll, I'll read from an excerpt from this is Patterson. And I'll start with a child bride. I was 14 when I married my husband, Charlie Patterson. He was 55 years old, and I was 14. 
I was finished with school by then. I don't know whether I loved my husband or not, but I married him. It was just, that's a good looking man, and that's all. He had curly hair, and mustache, and gold teeth. I liked that gold teeth. I just thought he was the prettiest man I'd ever seen. I had one brother that had 21 children. I got another brother with 22 children who wasn't married but one time. If you take care of yourself, you could have 50 children and still look good. All my children was born at home. A midwife birthed all my babies, except for William, my youngest, Sally Dawkins, and Miss Ethel Martin. They the only two midwives I had. If you get out and work, it don't bother you when you birth a baby. But if you sit on your ass when you get pregnant, you know it's going to bother you. You got to get out and work. See, I worked when I was pregnant. I picked cotton, two and three hundred pounds of cotton. I pulled tobacco. I strung tobacco, and I walked every day. I walked. I cooked, and I feed a crowd of people. I didn't have to. I just wanted to. My husband would go and get a crowd of people and pick cotton or tobacco, but I would cook. I cooked dinner for all of those people, and they would come to my house and eat. And then I'd wash the dishes and go back to the field and help them work. Work until I had my baby. So it didn't worry me now. The more you work, the better you have your children. If you walk a lot, it will make your bones come apart. It keep your joints loose enough. But if you sit down, them bones stay stuck together and everything, and it's hard having a baby. That's what makes you sick. And the doctor tells you when you get pregnant, the more you walk, the better you feel. I walk. I lift heavy things to make my babies come out fast. I never had no hard time. All my babies were easy. 13 children, 11 boys, and two girls. When William was born, you know what I was doing? I was cleaning up my house for Christmas, hanging up my curtains. It took about 30 minutes to push him out. I went out walking around and I said, I know it's time for my baby to come. I was there by myself. I called Clarence from across the road over there, and I say, Clarence, come on over here. What is it, Mama? Tell your wife to come here, because this little old baby going to be born directly. Well, I'm going to go get Miss Odessa. What you going to get Odessa for? Shit, this baby be born before Odessa get here. But they went uptown anyway to get Odessa. Mama sick, Odessa. She wants you to come here. Odessa went down there to get the doctor. They didn't have but one doctor. All them children I had, I didn't have but one doctor, and that doctor was Dr. McAllister. By the time they got back here, that baby and I was sitting up on the side of the table. The baby was out. <coughs> yeah, he looked it. He looked it white, nothing but white. All my babies looked it like they was white. It's just white skin. When I was in the South, people would say, she's black, but she's white. So it was just. It's not, it's not, uh, that's what they meant. With my babies, if it's born tonight, I have my husband cook me a great big bowl of salad for dinner the next day. Collard green salad, poke salad, or anything, anything green. He would give me some collard greens, or either give, get, go um, buy some cabbage if there wasn't no collards around. He'd cook that cabbage, cook me some cornbread, give me some back back meat, I eat me a good meal. I put a lot of nutrients in my body, and I never had no problems. I didn't do nothing to my babies after they come out. The midwife would clean them up and grease them down good with castor oil and wrap them up and put them into bed. I'd stay in the bed with the baby about two days. Then I would get up, but I wouldn't go out the house for a week. Then my baby would get two weeks old, I would go back to doing my work, my cooking, my cleaning, picking, my vegetables and stuff. Didn't sit down none. I had to cook. I had all them children to feed. Some folks have to go back to the field, but I didn't have to go to the field because I had so many children. When I do my work, the baby would be in the bed asleep. When they wake up, I take them and feed them. 
and, and let them nourish your breasts, then they go right back to sleep. So there you are. All my babies weigh 10 pounds. I ain't never had a baby that weighed just a few pounds. They eat everything. They get their hands on. I never had a baby that nursed a bottle. I nursed them from my breast. One of them, the little girl Anne, liked to do what her daddy do. He did snuff. He never put snuff back in his mouth like everybody else. He had a little toothbrush. He cut off about yay long and keep it in the snuff box and make it a big ball out of it and take that toothbrush and put it back in his mouth and put that big wad of snuff on it. You think he had a tobacco in his job, but he didn't even chew tobacco. And the little one would just beg for it. She begged for it. She wanted that what he was putting in his mouth. He told her, you can't get this bag. This is snuff. And then she got it anyway. And she went on the floor and cried. And he said, I'm going to fix her. Next time, I just might let her taste some. And, and eventually he did. And she did snuff to this day. So that's just an excerpt from Miss Ruth Patterson from Wolfpick, North Carolina, um, who was, um, in addition to the local healer, but also a group worker, and uh, uh, had a um, uh, creek liquor joint, because in that area they did not have local bars for people to go to at the time, so they would go to her house to drink after work and just, you know, get, get chew the fat with other folks around there. So that's just an example of some of the type of stories and um, the information I got about what people did. Um, but, you know, it was hard. It was hard. It was real hard. In addition to just, um, taking care of the babies. It was hard to take care of yourself. And then you had to navigate through you know, a racist society. But they survived. And um, um, I'm, happy. I'm, a, I'm happy to be here today to be able to share this information. The book is um, broken up into different sections. I um, took all of the information that the healers and the elders gave me, and I created a medicines section um, with all of the medicines that were used in here, so it's like a medicinal reference book. And also there's a section on remedies, so I took all of the remedies that they had, that they used, um, and uh, created a, a section on remedies by ailment. So there's a section on female health in here, and also a section on fertility, a uh, section on uh, babies for babies. And one of the interesting thing that they did, taking care of the baby as well as themselves for teething. Um, they would go out and get a wasp comb, an empty wasp comb, and give it to the baby so that they can gnaw on them. Mm -hmm. um, there were, um, and I think it's for babies in here, there were a um, whole list of conditions for babies. This is athlete's foot. After that is baby conditions from colds, colic, hives and rashes, Naval protrusion, teething, um, or call it. They used to give something called astaphidity or astaphis. Is anyone familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Which is actually argumentative. It comes from the asafoetida plant and probably came up to the Americas through um, the Caribbean because they were enslaving and had indentured servants of East Indian folks also. Uh, castor oil, um, hives and rashes, um, the moisturizer and skin softener. So if you, in addition to caring for self or, or females and babies, uh, you can look in here for other um, ailments such as bee stings or measles, um, cuts and wounds. 
using spider webs uh, and aloe to pack deep cuts and wounds. And spider webs uh, have regenerative properties in it uh, as well. I have a few of them in my house still. Uh, under female health, I have um, information for fertility, hormone regulations, and general ma maintenance, um, uh, which is very important, uh, particularly before you're pregnant and after you're pregnant. Um, and uh, just um, remedies to uh, make sure that you're healthy through the different stages of a woman's life. I can speak a little bit about my own uh, postpartum care after I had my own children, which um, um, really, I don't even think about uh, caring for myself. You're in such a mode of caring for the child, of um, nursing and making sure that they're healthy, making sure you get the right things in your body, which was, I ate a lot of greens and beans and yams, and also, um, um, meats as well, because I needed the protein in my own body, um, and beets. My grandmother was very adamant of eating beets and the beet greens, because it put iron back into my system. Um, my son, for both my son and daughter, I um, made them organic foods. They nursed, my son nursed for six months, and then he didn't want any more. My daughter nursed for 26 months and she wanted more, but she kept on biting my nipple and laughing. <laughs> so I said, you know, that, that was it. So e even just reflecting personally in terms of my own care, I, I can't, uh, you're, you're, mo you're in such a mode of caring for child and working and your family that, and even today, you know, as women, doing the same thing, hold, holding so many different layers um, that, um, I think I need to go back and do some postpartum care for myself. <laughs> I don't know, Yemanya, do you want to chime in on, do, when you had your children, I had two, you had how many? I actually gave birth to four. Okay. Do you and, recall um, yourself doing any specific postpartum care? Postpartum care for me was my blender and my juicer. That was one of the major things for me because I didn't have an appetite. So it was really important for me to juice. And I use edible yeast now, not the kind that we use <laughs> for bread. Um, but I use the edible yeast. I used avocado, um, banana, apricot, mango, peaches, uh, and blended them up with spinach. And uh, added, at that time, I was doing soy or goat, because uh, I've always been allergic to cow's milk. And, um, um, and added honey and molasses. And those that was like a full meal for me. Um, and sometimes I would throw some oats in there just because I needed just a little something heavier that lasted a little bit longer. But to get all the nutrients, because just the avocado itself has got more nutrients than most other things, but to add the iron that I need. Uh, and, you know, with the molasses that adds the iron and the potash that, you know, you need. Uh, but the other thing was, of course, I just did big salads because I was vegan. And so for my son, I juiced carrots, apples, celery, and beets. And I used to drink at least a quart of carrot juice a day. Strongest teeth, this guy had the strongest teeth. Um, <laughs> And plus, I had so much milk till I had it in jars in the refrigerator. So I used to actually like make cornbread and <laughs> stuff like that. Well, I did. And when we had potlucks, oh man. I made, <laughs> I made, look, I was living in North Oakland, Berkeley, and when I had my daughter in 1980, and we gave a big potluck. And you know, we did our beans and rice and fish for people that ate fish. But, I made beans and rice, and I made this two big sheet pans of cornbread from scratch, right? With breast milk in it. <laughs> okay. And I was like, where did you get that cake? And what I said, that's cornbread. Is that jiffy? No. <laughs> it made everything so light and easier to digest than the heavy coarseness that comes with 
cow milk. And I never did tell them the secret till like years later. <laughs> that I had so much milk in the freezer and in the jars, the mason jars. I was just like, my cup runs over. I was like, I'd go someplace and say I'd be back by a certain time. You know, my girlfriend would be babysitting. And I couldn't get back because my milk would start flowing. So I would be pumping, right? Um, the other aspect for me was they had mother's friend by the time I got here. But it was a teeny tiny bottle like this, right? And my grandmother told me, baby, remember when I told you about, you know, you're supposed to take that olive oil bath. She said, you bathe that baby, don't put that baby in no water. You bathe that baby with oil, you know? And that's what they told me to bathe my children in. So their skin is really, really beautiful. By the time the one pound nine ouncer came, that was the biggest I had ever been. And I had three C-sections back to back. Um, and that whole idea of taking laxatives to the hospital, taking them before I left and taking them to the hospitals so after I gave birth, it was imperative that I had those because I had went for almost two and a half weeks without a bowel movement. So my body temperature, I couldn't control my body temperature. And I was dying just from not having a bowel movement. And they said I was impacted, so you know, oops. Went olive oil out, y'all. I'm drinking olive oil like it was going out of style between the indigestion and the hair, you know, uh, heartburn from hair. My daughter came out with all this hair, even down her back. She had hair all the way down her spine. And uh, I had to do that olive oil to keep them from going into me after having the surgery. Because they had me tied off because I had C-section. So I wouldn't have lost memory. Uh, there, but just the whole idea of trying to have bowel movement so constipated because my intestinal organs had been exposed to air, mm -hmm. so it dehydrated everything. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we talk about how much water we can drink, but you can drink so much water, but if you're already dried internally because you've been opened up and exposed, then you have to do something different. So they said do a warm, soapy water with oil uh, enema. They do that for babies too, you know, in the little bulb, bulb thing. But I had to do that, otherwise they were gonna have to go up in with their fingers mm -hmm. and pull everything out. Um, so my grandma then was talking to me, this is my, you know, the first baby, okay, you know, with the two boys, two of the boys, I died. We both died and they brought us back. And so I had to come back. My husband had brought me cherry juice because the um, people from Senegal told him that cherry juice would help bring my, my iron back up real quick and get my vitamin C going and everything. Well, he brought the cherry juice the day, the day after I gave birth. I drank the cherry juice and ended up having to have my stomach pump because my intestines had started working. Yes. Mm -hmm. So having a C-section and then having my stomach pumped was, oh my God, horrendous, right? Then my mom come in and laughing about the three stooges and all this stuff, and I'm trying to laugh with pillows on my stomach, holding it in to try to laugh because I got the C-section. When I had my baby, my, my fourth child, he was one pound nine ounces, so I was like 225 pounds, so I thought I was having me a 10 pound baby. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm fixing to have one of these big old babies, you know? No, I couldn't pass it through this little spot down here. Okay, my body was going in instead of my hips opening out. So I had to do red raspberry, all the um, cam uh, chamomile, things that relaxed me. But they never did relax my muscles. Everything just went inside. My hips went concave instead of coming out. So for the one pound, nine ounce baby, we died. I came back and he was in the hospital for four months straight from December 8th all the way to April the 3rd to uh, 1994. You see Davis Miracle, baby. Breast milk does wonders, y'all, because he's wearing a size 14 and a half shoe. <laughs> he stands 5'11", almost six feet, and he's deaf and non-speaking, extremely literate, okay? He just has focus where other people hear everything his whole thing is focused, but um, he had colostomy, ileostomy, he had uh, IV infiltration, if you all know what that is. 
um, you know, our IV infiltrations where, you know, when the little teen babies, they're trying to hydrate them and stuff, they give them all these IVs in their hands, in the tops of their feet. Uh, he's got needle marks everywhere. Now, he talks to me about it. the colostomy, you know, uh, scars, milliostomy scars. The IV infiltration was in the head because they sometimes, because they're so little, they put it in the veins in their head and neck. Mm. Okay? Too many babies or oops, whatever her problem she didn't check him and turn him. And so this whole part got burnt by the mm -hmm. calcium chloride that was coming through the IV. Mm -hmm. So this whole, it looked like it was dying size at the time because he was so little. By the time he got one, two, three, it was the size, it was like three inches here and about seven back here. Okay, because he, as he got bigger, his cranial got bigger, the scar stretch. So they did a scar reduction. So he had two scar reductions, uh, which affected whatever speech he would have had on the right hand side. Um, and then they wanted me to give him a cochlear implant. And I thought to myself, my baby's gonna have all these IV, you know, uh, pokes all over him, colostomy, ileostomy. Retina pigmentosis, where the retina comes up off the eye. So they cauterized his retinas. He had two those surgeries in each eye before he was even two months old. Um, so when they went to do the cochlear implant, which meant breaking the back of the bone here and running wires up in, and since he had never heard, except for at the very beginning when I sustained to him, um, and since the damage from the from the IV infiltration and the surgery. He hadn't heard any sound, except for underwater about 40 feet. Um, I thought to myself, you know what? Creator brought him to me like this, and I'm gonna let him be. I didn't want them, they had already cut on him enough. Uh, the other thing was they had him on prednisone. And with the prednisone, this is after. Now meanwhile, I'm depressed as heck, y'all. Okay, because five months after we got him out of the hospital, the fourth month, the fifth month, his father was murdered. And so here I was with a brand new baby, a 15 year old, and a 17 year old. So they're on their way to woman and manhood, and I got this brand new baby that's just four pounds. So I used to carry him on a pillow to remind me that I had a baby. Uh, psychologically, it was really hard because they wanted me to sign him over in the hospital. They wanted me to sign him over because they said he'd never hear, speak, see, he would be a vegetable, all these things. They did not run me. He does gymnastics, popping and breaking, mm -hmm. off the wall, okay? Uh, everything they said that he wasn't gonna be able to do, excuse me, remember, this baby comes from your womb your strong bloodline lineage, and I had to walk like my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, the great-great, all the women in my lineage came through. I wouldn't even speak no English to them. I was probably a Francais and a deaf girl. They thought I was from some other country. Because I was poor, and I knew <coughs> if they knew I was poor and from America, that they were going to try to take my baby. So they wanted me to sign him over. They sent about 16 different people into the room to have them speak French to me, or to speak to me, to ask me what country I was from. Because <coughs> they figured if it was an international thing, they couldn't take the baby. So I had to think like that. I had to think on my feet in order for me to take my baby home. And I, breast, I, I breastfed him, and then they said, no, they were gonna garbage me. That's when they punctured his intestines and they said that it was uh, due to prematurity. And so that's when I had to learn how to clean a colostomy bag and sing to my baby. They told me they had him an incubator that came from Sweden. It was a special one. He was the first one to use it at UC Davis. And they told me I couldn't touch him and talk to him at the same time. Oops, mm -hmm. I was saying, I was at Crocker Art Gallery, I was saying, danced, everything with this baby. Did too much. Hands all up over my head, I'm flying in the air, girlfriend, big old belly, whoop, whoop, okay. But I had.
had to make a decision because his father wasn't strong enough. He was in shock. This is his first baby. He was like, when they, when they gave me my IV in the back, after I had been in, um, I had been in labor for almost three days. I started two days at home, and by the time I got done levitating in the car, whole body just shaking. They, you know, he's trying to drive, and my body is levitating up in the like this. This it's like I was having tremors. Um, when I got there, then they said we're doing an emergency C-section. But uh, I can honestly say, you sing, sing, and sing. You read, read, and read. Mm -hmm. We bathe ourselves in, remember they used to talk about bathe yourself in milk and honey? Mm -hmm. Those things are real. Because our skin is the largest organ on our body. It absorbs everything. If you can't put it in your eyes or your mouth, why would you put it on your hair or your skin? If you're putting formaldehyde on your skin, that means you're absorbing formaldehyde. Okay, I'm going to go there. Okay, I'm ridiculous, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just, I just went straight holistic. And with him, I made all his, well, all three of my children, I made all their baby foods. They came here vegan. We had... Uh, uh, carrot burgers with tofu, you know, things that were digestible. I didn't start them on food, food, uh, and I definitely didn't start them on any baby foods at all. I just uh, boiled yams, boiled rice, uh, used a nut milks, uh, made sure there was plenty of carrot juice and meat juice and the whole thing. Strong children, strong moms. Actually, I did because I drank juice every day. I, I mean, I was on, and I was on that blender because sometimes I, I couldn't handle the snow cooked food, and it was hard on me. It almost nauseated me. And anybody walking up to me with any forms of cologne, oops, mm -hmm. you know, don't and you stink. You know, it, it it heightens everything. You be smelling from way over there. Oh no, he's not coming over here to try to say hi to me. You know, I was kind of like that. You know, real sight. You know, sensitive, and really and truthfully, I have to say, my two uh, boys, they were so sensitive. Till if anybody went to touch them, either they would slap me or they would be trying to leap up out of my arms because they they weren't into other people. My daughter, she was more or less, and if she didn't like you, she'd just slap you, and that was just it. So little people are, their psyche is more heightened. They are closer to the ancestors. Them and seniors are closer to the ancestors than we are. We're like in between, you know. They can tell you things about people that you think are cool. They will let you know ahead of time they're going to either go behind you or they're not going to make eye contact, or they're going to be giving them that oops space. I know you don't think you can touch me or talk to me. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, they really do go there. And what they do, I say that little people are brought here to guide us. We are nurturing them. A lot of them come here, little teeny midget mini -mees. They didn't came here, they was old. They didn't reincarnate and came back to tell you what you're supposed to be doing. You know, and I had to learn to listen. You know, because we're because we're physically bigger, we think that we know it all. But they see things that we don't see sometimes. You know, and a part of postpartum sometimes is the baby protecting the mother in any way that they possibly can. Little tall, little taller to walk up to you and hit you and kick you and stuff like that. They don't want you close to their mom. You know, but they feel things that we don't. And sometimes, like in my situation, because I had died and I was trying to make a comeback, my baby was two and a half years old at home when I gave birth to his sister. And he was so protective. And he went and got, he went and got diapers. He went and tried to get some food. The baby's crying, trying to get her out of the crib, those kind of things. And I remember after giving birth to her, having a miscarriage. And I had one baby in the crib asleep, and here's my little two, he's three at this point. And 
he's trying to help me by giving me toilet paper while I'm having this miscarriage. And his dad is out doing woo, 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 woo. So we ain't gonna go there today because you know they be doing things, you know. In fact, I feel that during pregnancy and postpartum are probably um, two of the most dangerous periods in our life as women, besides our pre-teens and elementary. <laughs> and dating time. But having a baby, carrying a baby, you're vulnerable. You're strong as an ox, but they feel because you're being sensitive because you love them that you're open season for battery. You know, I, I know I'm going another way, but we're all women in here, okay? And when you're pregnant, you're sensitive because you're in love with this person. You're taught that when you get pregnant by a man, you're supposed to stay with him until, you know, the burning bed syndrome, I'm gonna go here. But we have to remember that we have to nurture ourselves. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if he's talking down to you or treating you like there's nothing that you can do right, you don't talk about him, you don't argue with him, you don't write him no letter until after you long gone. sensitive to yourself and if your children are reacting to his misbehavior they're talking to you about it's time for a transition you know women have done it throughout centuries we've been queens and royalty and warriors throughout centuries carrying babies on our back and on our front or on our shoulders or tied to our hips we done breastfed our men, because they be on that titty. Don't get me started, because I had one on this titty and the other one on that. Now this is the baby, and this food and came, okay? Uh, meanwhile, I'm supposed to, and then my son, I tried to break him from breastfeeding, because I had three on the breast, and then my godchildren, the twins, uh, their mom was going to work, so I was wet nursing their mom here in North Oakland, Berkeley. I was wet nursing the twins, and then I had my little girl, because they were 13 days apart. That way she could go back to work. So my work was taking care of the children at home. And uh, I'll tell you, and then at night when fellow came home, it was like, you know, he was on that other one, and I could, I, I mean, I had Bowser's for the first time in my life, I got on Bowser's, you know. Uh, my mom took my, my little boy, he was three, going on four and still thought he was supposed to breastfeed. He wants some nanny pop, okay? She took him to San Jose and gave him a dry tag to keep him, you know, to stop him from breastfeeding because, I mean, I was getting more wow. Yeah. You know, and the biting on the, on the nipple and you have to kind of, you know, put your finger in their mouth and kind of slide that over and then you get to the point where you just pop them, you know what I mean? So, there, I mean, you do. I know you slime. I ain't trying to beat nobody's baby or nothing like that because it was my baby. You know, I'm loving this little cute thing. But at the same time, I got to. Because, <laughs> you, know, you know, you don't hurt them. You just kind of give them a little shit. A little bit of that. So, I really use a lot of oil. I have to honestly say, I don't know if you guys would want to see my. I have no stretch marks. I have no stretch marks. No stretch marks. My daughter has no stretch marks. My mother had no stretch marks. My grandmother had all the children and had no stretch marks. Mm -hmm. So there was something that was passed down. See, because that grandmother had, like I said, the 15. My mom was number 13 of the 15. And um, I'm their, her firstborn. My other grandmother only had my father, period, point blank. Whatever she was using for birth control was working, period. Okay? And they use lard where I came from. They what they would do is stuff their vagina with lard. Otherwise, they had to work with quinine, or they was working with angelica, angelica, which is a hallucinogen. Mm -hmm. That's a question actually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering the introduction that you um, so nicely portrayed. Did the information come from? Your family. It comes from my bloodline lineage, mm -hmm. yes. Because my family uh, went to Nicodemus. They started going to Nicodemus, Kansas. There were indigenous bloodline parts of my family. The Pawnee, the Kickapoo are right there in, in our region. But then we also had indigenous 
come from Louisiana, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Mississippi. So everything that I told to you before in my character was all true. This was a story that was passed down from generation to generation to me. My grandmother had, like I said, all these children, and their children had children. But for some reason or another, she tried to pass on this information to all of us, but because I, I had asthma severely, that's why they put me on goat milk. That's why I only did vegetables and stuff. So I had to stay indoors while everybody else was out playing. So I learned to weave, I learned to do pottery, I learned to do embroidery, all of the folk arts, it's my natural. I quilt, uh, you know, everything has to do with fiber, art, uh, beadwork and leather, they gave it to me because I had to stay indoors. So they told the story. They sang the stories, told the stories to all of us. But I was the one that, they, that I retained. So because my retention was so heavy, they passed me around to all the elders' homes. So I go stay two weeks here. And then, because my mom was my grandmother's youngest, so what she did, and she was only 17, we're 17 years apart, but she just passed away last year. But so because I was a teenage mom's baby, they passed me around to all the elders. And all the elders gave me gifts. Mm -hmm. And they gave me truths about our bloodlines. So I am the medicine woman for the women of Nicodemus. I am a shaman medicine woman for Mount Shasta, Golden Honey Owl medicine woman. And I just got uh, initiated to a degree for the women's healing circle. So I'm doing women's womb healing circles, uh, women of color and women in general, and I'm doing interracial healing circles for UC Davis Medical Center. So mm, I just come in and tell my truths because I get to walk with this because I am a descendant of the original Exodusters that were given their 40 acres in the mule. Uh, we have our own all black and Indian township. As of this day, when I wake up tomorrow, it still exists in Nicodemus, Kansas. And at the end of July, the last weekend of July going into August, we have our um, family reunion every year. Um, and I come from, my cousins call us the Jones, the tribe called Jones. So we went from Jackson to Jones, because Jones was a Welsh free name. So everything I told you was true. And they actually, if you go into the history and you look up Maria Dorsey, you will see the wanted poster for $1,000 for her. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my grandmother's great grandmother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other question I have was, I'm wondering if you can share with us a little bit more what inspired the book and mm -hmm. where, what would you, how did you find the book? Um, it's, it's, yeah, I'd like to stay here. Um, I, I grew up with the traditions in my family and not realizing it was something special or unique. I mentioned earlier, I'm a first gen I call myself a first generation northerner because everyone before me came from the deep south, the Gulf, Gulf region. And I was able to trace back seven generations, both from Louisiana and Mississippi, and then it led to Virginia, and also traced back to an African name, Seraphine Tempo. Mm -hmm. So with mixing with all of the New Orleans, Hoodoo, Catholic, and the Mississippi, who do whatever, the indigenous mixture, the Chinese mi mixture, I come from the Mississippi Chinese lineage also, the Creole Choctaw mi mixture, it was just something that we grew up with. Uh, uh, elders um, talking to spirits, and talking to ancestors, which is absolutely normal, using um, home remedies um, on us that we thought were strain, particularly when um, you're in elementary school and they have you putting your own urine on your face and 
earwax here and making up concoctions for um, coughs and colds and preventatives, you know, to keep you um, well, we just, we, we thought everyone grew up like that. And then being in Oakland at the time I was raised, um, in, in the 50s and 60s, you had communities that came directly from New Orleans and Mississippi that knew each other back there. So it's almost like being in the South, but you're up north. And as I got older and went out into the world, and um, I got most of my degrees in the, in the fine arts, um, and was a professional artist for 15 years after graduate school, um, I realized through doing performances that um, um, what this, this knowledge and this history, this lineage I have is very special. Uh, particularly the medicinal history. And I wanted to document it because it's an oral tradition. And the only way to get it is to go down and start interviewing people. Because everything I had read was very academic. And um, it didn't reflect at all what I experienced, which was so much richer. And so I started with, of course, everybody in my own family and then um, I moved to rural North Carolina and lived down a dirt road for four years. We moved to Oakland, California, to rural North Carolina, which was where my my husband, who's now my former husband, who was married for 17 years, um, was raised in this small town. And I based myself there. Had wonderful experiences with all of the peoples down there, and, and not just reading about the South, but actually living it day in and day out. Um, and one person led me to the next. Um, and North Carolina was a beautiful place to be because I was close to the deep south and then I was close to close to Virginia and you know Maryland and other parts. And so and, and it has a very rich um, community where the indigenous and the African folks mix. And um, such as if you look at the Tuscarora, or the Okanichi Saponi, or the Meharan, and the uh, Wakama, and the Chara, and the Yamasi, you know, and then go on down to, of course, the Seminole. And all of those peoples down there, you can tell that they're an admixture of bi and tri racial peoples, the, the story of the beginnings of America. Um, so it just one thing led to the next, and I, I felt compelled that it was important to get it down from their voice. Um, because I, I did very little editing. I wanted their, their knowledge to stay intact and not to, you know, rephrase it from an academic viewpoint. I did interject my voice as a first generation northerner novice who really knows nothing about the South, and if I take certain medicines, I could definitely take myself out. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's how you hear my voice. So I wanted, it, it, and also I felt it was a piece of American history that um, needed to be told in a particular kind of way. So like, for example, uh, small, the smallpox vaccine came about because of an enslaved African named Onesimus, because Africans already knew how to inoculate in Africa before the colonizers got there. And some of the plantation owners were wondering why, while everyone else was dying from smallpox, you know, their, their, their slaves, I hate using that word, their enslaved Africans were not. And so finally, after so many years, um, they finally um, asked Oni Sinus, you know, why aren't uh, um, um, why aren't 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 these people dying? And he said, Well, we're inoculating. Let me show you how how we do it, and let me show you how it works. And from there, a vaccine was made and given to the world. So that's hugely important because we know that it decimated uh, the indigenous folks and, uh, by contact and also by uh, blankets that were given to them filled with, mm -hmm. you know, smallpox. So, you know, when, when we, we live in a climate, particularly today, of uh, eugenics and also of 
these um, uh, ideas of white superiority um, and, uh, and over anyone else that has any type of melanin in their skin or is different uh, from um, who's in power now, I wanted to, you know, say, put this out there. <coughs> that, um, um, and dispel the myth that these are old wives' tales, that actual knowledge from Africa came, you know, here that is helping and saving people. Like, for example, the eating chocolate clay is the same as taking bentonite in colon cleanses. It binds heavy metals and toxins in addition to giving you nutrients. It keeps your intestines clean, which we now know is to be the seat of all illnesses and diseases. And also that there was um, a, um, a system of preventative care to not get sick so you don't have to miss work. And if, if you didn't have money, and it could be extremely dangerous. So people did preventative health care all the time. And one of the things that the old folks said is that once they stopped taking the cod liver oil, if they moved up north, that's when they started getting sick. And so if you look at what's in cod liver oil, and it's considered a superfood, it increases your T cell count in your body, and it also, you know, it acts like, uh, it, it reduces inflammation, it helps a lot of um, operations in your body run smoothly, regulating blood pressure, insulin levels, and so taking it regularly, as like we treat our cars regularly um, with maintenance, really helps for us to have optimum health. So that uh, daily dosage um, helps people stay healthy. Before that, you had um, herbs such as yellow root, which is golden seal, and the tonics that we're taking on a regular basis and seasonally. Um, castor oil is a huge me medicine, not just for purging, but anti-inflammatory, reducing masses internally, uh, for um, rheumatoid arthritis and other things. It's really, and hope, hope um, is just so powerful in many, many different ways. It's, uh, as a medicine, um, it can, um, the, it's called cancer root. It's been used for generations uh, between, and this medicine isn't just unique, you know, to African Americans. In the South, we have whites, blacks, and Indians, all using this medicine, it leads in and out. Of, of all of those communities. But, uh, you know, poke root is called cancer root. The poke berry is, um, relieves arthritis and rheumatism. It'll take some pain off you. It will, it will. Um, the medical industry um, says it's toxic. It is toxic, like anything can be toxic. You just have to know how to take it. Um, and um, I recently made a salve to poke root for a friend who had a huge mass in his arm and he was afraid because he didn't have health insurance. And after a couple of months of using that salve, it disappeared. Um, so there's, there's a lot of knowledge that our ancestors possess, uh, our elders just in general possess, um, that um, 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 kept us healthy. And we can go you know, back to that. Um, they use magnesium sulfate, Epsom salt, quite frequently, which we know is, is a nerve line. It helps to relax and also we know no toxins from our body. Um, so that's pretty much what, you know, it, it's just fascinating. I'm, I'm proud, of, I feel like I've given this piece of authentic history to um, add to this American story to make it uh, more correct um, than, than what the media puts out there. Yeah. And I, I think we have to really thank you because um, the timing is so crucial. Yes. In another 10 years, we won't have anybody to do it. Right. Yeah. Even now, you know, I'm looking for folks, and Jay Manyao is, is a treasure, but a lot of the people. I uh, interviewed, have transitioned on, and even if I started that now, it, I wouldn't have gotten that timing was, yes. and I just, you know, I funded this mostly myself. I never think about, well, how much it's going to cost, and I did not um, want to um, 
I tried looked for a publisher for a while, but I said I don't need them to validate me. Plus, I'll have to go through, you know, all of this um, editing and how they want me to change it and and change the voice of the people. And so I didn't want to do that either. So I just continued on steady for 22 years through life, you know, ups and downs, and um, finally, you know, it's it's here. One of the things that I'd like to do is put my put my website on so you all can go on to my website and see some of the things that I haven't been able to present as a visual. I actually am uh, bloodline Yoruba by way of the Watts and the Dorseys. And, um, so let me just clarify that. That means that she um, was not initiated by someone who came over here after the um, the Middle Passage ended, it, it, or after um, slavery ended. She was initiated by her bloodline that preserved the tradition through slavery, which is pretty remarkable. I, I don't know anyone else who has that same history. Yeah, it's pretty rare. When I came to the Bay Area and started going to college, everybody wanted to know where I got my name from. But my grandmother spoke seven languages, and she was head over. Uh, she was superintendent of colored schools in the fifties, because they called them colored. Uh, one of the things that she did tell me was that she did not want to tell me what type of indigenous uh, Washita I was, because she said I would um, live longer being a Negro. Uh, because they were raping and killing the women right in front of their their families, and she had been taken from my gra uh, my great grandmother and put in Indian schools, and so because she had lived that, uh, she didn't want that for us, and she said that the reservations were prison camps, and that's what she called them, and so she didn't. She said, "You, uh, you, be." The African part. And she said, Ich spreche sie Deutsch, ich spreche Francais, habla Espanol como tu quieres. She says, Speak as many languages more or less as you possibly can because we are all of these. I have uh, my grandfather's mother, she came from Juarez, Mexico, Apache, Comanche, uh, Mexican Indian. So, you know, um, so, and, and her name was Alejandra. She was Ali Hydra Bates at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so they took me all the way back before the Mayflower where my grandmother's, my father's mother was her grandfather's slave who was a Dutch sea captain until she was 13 years old. And so slavery was just that close. My father's mother was a slave. And she was the only female born from the 1600s until I came 50 years after she was born. So, and I'm an only when it comes to them. So I was, it was my grandmother, and then 50 years later, I was born. So they just gave me as much knowledge as they possibly could because the women held the history. And I was her first grandchild. Uh, that was a different story. The whippings were prevalent, <laughs> and the crab apple tree was my enemy. <laughs> but that was because they said I talked too much. Because I would just tell, them. just tell. Them. Why are you going over someone? You know they don't like you. Well, I or I get to their front porch and have an asthma attack and be in the hospital for the next two weeks because she didn't need to be there. But how does a little person tell a grown-up that they don't need to go visit another grown-up? So I kind of was very uh, psyche sensitive, uh, super emotional, and uh, you know. And most of the time, everything that I was telling to them was true, so they had to come back. Yeah, baby, go again. Oh my God. I want to make sure um, everyone has time for questions. We only have a few more minutes. Um, so we have questions. Yes. Yes. Oh, I have some copies here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely.